Hey folks, it's Isolation Nation. It's day number seven for us. It is April the 9th and the 22nd straight day that I've worn pants without a button. Today's show, why am I wearing this amazing hat, by the way? This is a helmet, uh, a real firefighter's helmet. And today we ask the question, sure, you can protect your head, you can protect your eyes, you can protect the back of your neck. But what about COVID-19? We've got Ryan Gallagher, who's a mental health advocate and a firefighter, to talk about that. Plus, we've got a doctor, as we try to do every day, and Rosie McLennan. Look, Riggs, Riggs, take a look at this. He loves this video. You love this video, don't you? He does. Take it from me. Trampoline, Rosie McLennan, two-time gold medalist in this country, and she is going to join us today. She's also a mental health advocate. And, well, let's face it, she has been through a lot. When I get to breaking points, I kind of feel like I'm losing control of my mind. I almost, like, get this, like, tingling sensation through my core, and um, I find it harder to breathe. Like, my ribs feel constricted and, like, chest feels constricted. It's almost like there's, like, a tipping point after which I can't come back, and I'll just completely break down, start crying and panicking and breathing uncontrollably. You know, Rosie, you're talking about your symptoms there. And I'm thinking she's talking to me when you, when you were talking about how it feels running through your body like that, I'm thinking, Oh my gosh, she has experienced many of exactly the same things, but we'll talk about that in a second. First of all, Rosie McClendon, what a pleasure to meet you. How are you doing? I'm all right. How are you doing? You know, I'm uh, I'm doing I'm doing really well. I mean, this is uh, the weirdest time probably in the history of the planet uh, since World War II, maybe. <laughs> no, I'd like to I'd like to prove the research I do, but I try to make it sound really casual. So wait a second here. World War II wasn't your grandfather supposed to compete in gymnastics in 1940 in Tokyo? He was, uh, but those uh, Olympics got canceled, so he never yeah. had the opportunity to represent Canada at the Olympic Games. Now, you, of course, uh, have uh, have more than uh, carried the flag for uh, both the country and for your family as well. Two-time gold medalist, the first uh, Canadian ever to repeat in an individual sport, and you were the flag bearer in uh, Brazil. I, I know that when they came to you and said, uh, Rosie, we want you to carry the flag, your reaction was what? I was shocked in a lot of ways, but uh, I knew the date that they were supposed to make the call to tell the flag bearer and the call didn't come that day. So I assumed the call I was getting was to let me know that they had chosen someone else, uh, but it wasn't. And it took me a few days to really wrap my head around it. And it was something I dreamed about as a kid, but never really thought I'd have the opportunity or the honor to do myself. Well, you know, people, uh, you, you, you are one of those people that people just like, right? You're easy to cheer for. No, it's true. I mean, like, like not every athlete, even not every gold medal athlete for Canada. I mean, we don't love them all, but people love you because of your sense of humility, your sense of being real. Uh, and part of that reality comes from the fact that you have spoken like the rest of us with mental health challenges. Uh, you talked about anxiety in that documentary that was done by TSN. When, when were you first aware of the fact that maybe what I'm experiencing in my head and those symptoms are not normal? Um, I mean, I can remember uh, circumstances or situations from high school and university where I had these like cyclical patterns of experiencing what I now recognize as almost like panic attacks. Um, but I think it was really um, when I had my concussions and that really exacerbated the symptoms of anxiety and like brought on a lot of other challenges. Uh, that I really took the time and had the access to the resources to figure out what I was experiencing. Um, and it also, it took a while to even learn the language to like communicate what I was experiencing too, um, and to have the courage to reach out and ask for help. Um, so I think that, I mean, the first time I reached out for um, some mental health support was before London. Um, but I think it became, I became more aware that it was a recurring Thing, um, when I was experiencing my concussions. 
When you say that, you know, you had to find the courage to be able to come out and, and, and talk about it and to ask for help. That, that, is, that is something that so many people are, are on the other side of it because they're still trying to find the courage to be able to say, hey, you know, I need help and to tell a spouse I need help or to tell a parent I need help. Um, what, what did you experience that when, when you say that you, you had to find the courage to come out? What were you experiencing before that? Why were you so concerned? Uh, I think it was almost a self-awareness aspect too. I had to be honest with myself about what I was experiencing and that it wasn't just going to simply go away without um, action uh, in a way. And like I knew at that point, I didn't know what to do for myself. And I mean, you can talk to your a couple of friends. I was lucky to have a few friends that I was able to chat with, but it wasn't until like I kept feeling like I couldn't figure it out um, that I realized that I did need to go to a professional I guess right. um but I think it's a lot about admitting it to yourself first and acknowledging that you need the support yourself and once you do that it becomes a little bit easier to reach out to others were you concerned about how um not not really the world would see you but how your sport would see you because you know I mean there's there's an image that you're supposed to have as a as a, a top athlete and and that is to be one of strength and people worry that the perception will be that the mental illness is showing weakness now obviously I don't mm. believe that but a lot of people do and that's what keeps them sort of in the closet um I guess there was some nervousness around that. Um, but I mean, we've been also been really fortunate to have athletes like Clara Hughes come out and speak about their experiences. And um, I think with that, it's kind of opened the door. And I mean, not all of the stigma, stigma by any means, but some of that stigma has been decreased. And I think there is an open, like a conversation that's more accessible now. Um, but I think it's really like asking for help at any point, like does take an aspect of like self-awareness and courage. And I, yeah, I, I don't know if I was nervous about what people would think. Cause I think I was at a point where I, it was so clear that I needed help that that wasn't a consideration. Well, just so you know that, you know, you say that it was easier because Clara Hughes came out and, and spoke about her challenges. Um, you're now doing the same for somebody else, right? Because someone would would watch you and say, well, it's easier for me to come out because I heard Rosie talk about it. So it's like a big game of tag. And, yeah. you know, Clara tagged you and now you're going to tag someone else. And if enough people get tagged, then the stigma will disappear. But we got, we got a lot of work to do still, I think. Mm -hmm, for sure. Um, okay, so how were you feeling two months ago uh, before you heard the word uh, COVID? and corona and before you know before when when life was normal when you could go outside of your house when you could go in like me i could go into my father's house and hug him as opposed to leaving food on the doorstep and running away uh how were you feeling before that uh i mean we're in a, we well we were in an olympic year uh and that comes with some added pressure and some added stress uh physically and mentally and um, I was really focused on trying to allocate all of my energy to put, uh, putting myself in a position to qualify. Um, I had had success at the end of last year with Worlds, but with my injury earlier in the year, I was still trying to build back up and really uncertain about like how that would go. Um, so I was making progress towards that, but there was a lot of, I guess, stress that came with that, as you would have with any pre-games uh, the few months leading into an Olympic Games. Right. But one of the things that uh, Jeffrey Habert, uh, the doctor that we're going to speak to in a second, we were all having a sort of a round robin conversation before, is that I understand in my head there's a divider between the illness of depression, anxiety, and life's mm -hmm things that makes us sad. And I used the example of my mom. I said, my mom died mm -hmm. and that makes me sad, but it does not make me depressed. So can you distinguish between performance anxiety, which is, which is normal. Like I find it hard to believe that many people go to the Olympics and, and they're not, they're not anxious. They're not uptight. Mm -hmm. They're not, not worried, but that's normal life. Can you distinguish between the two? Um, I mean, in some ways, I think it like the extent to, of it is like, 
would maybe differentiate that. But for me, sport and life are so intertwined that it often there is some relation between the two. Um, though I have experienced, I guess, anxiety with non-sport related aspects. Um, but yeah, the reality for me right now is so much of my world, especially in the year leading into games, does revolve around sport and performance. Um, so they're pretty interrelated at the for right now, I guess, or okay. before I'm gonna, COVID. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, I'm going to ask you a question, which if the answer mm -hmm. is going to be yes, you will smile and go, I know what you're talking about. Do you watch mm -hmm. The Simpsons? <laughs> I used to. Not anymore. Okay. So do you know what I'm talking about? Because there's, uh, it, it's a trampoline thing. Uh, and uh, it's, it's quoted all the time by Simpsons fans. Uh, so uh, why don't we uh, roll this, Phil, take a look. Trampoline! Trampoline! He said what now? Please don't bring home any more old crutches. Oh, no, you don't. That trampoline is mine. Trampoline. <laughs> now, have you seen that before? Uh, I have, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I interviewed Daryl Strawberry once, and there's a famous Simpsons episode where Daryl Strawberry is playing right field on Mr. Burns' all-star team, and they're, they're taunting him, right? Uh, mm. And when I interviewed him, I said, do you know what I'm talking about? He goes, do I know what, I'm talk what you're talking about? He went, dude, it's The Simpsons. I was on The Simpsons. It was like the greatest thing in my life. Um, I have not okay. been on The Simpsons. <laughs> no, but they made reference to your sport. I, you know, before we get back into the serious discussion, uh, how did you get into trampoline? I, I was thinking that I think it, you know, in uh, when you were in Brazil, I was thinking, okay, trampoline is something that's recreational at one point for almost every every kid, but most of us, you know, never take it seriously. Once we get to the knee drop and the seat drop, like we're on to something else. So, <laughs> how, how did how did you get caught up in the sport? Uh, my older siblings, they were gymnasts and then they switched into trampoline and I just tagged along and been jumping ever since. <laughs> it, uh, it, it is, uh, what's the biggest country in, in the world for trampoline? Like where would it be? Um, cause I have a friend, Jonathan power who played squash, right. And was a top mm -hmm. squash player in the world, but squash isn't huge in Canada. But when he would go to certain middle Eastern countries, he would be like, like a, a star on the streets when he would walk through them. Where, what's the capital of trampoline? Uh, oh, I don't know. Uh, I know Japan, they have trampoline in the university system. I know in Great Britain, they have it in the school systems as well. So maybe one of those two. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's not the most common thing in the world, obviously. So uh, getting a chance to talk to a two-time gold medalist and many-time world champion uh, is a pretty cool experience for me. Uh, okay, <laughs> back to the uh, the series before uh, before we move on. Mm -hmm. You know, you were, you were scheduled, you were hoping to qualify for the Olympics. Uh, I had to phrase that correctly, right? Because I said to you before, you were planning on going to the Olympics, right? You went, well, I hadn't qualified yet, but I'm going to go on. <laughs> let's go on the assumption that things went okay. What, uh, what has it done to you mentally to find out these games have been postponed by a year? And what was the experience like of waiting for the IOC to come out and, and make a decision? Uh, I think initially there was a lot of, um, it was really challenging because we were like, we were experiencing all these closures. We were experiencing facilities getting shut down and like we're four months out from games and that's when we should really be peaking our performance and like fine tuning everything and really high intensity volume training. And we had a couple of world cups coming up. And so when training became sidetracked, it was, uh, kind of survival mode in the sense like you just do everything you can with what you have to put yourself in the best position in the circumstances you have. Um, when it became more clear that COVID was a lot bigger than I think what any of us could have anticipated, um, I think it became more clear that it wasn't viable for Canada to send a team. And so the decision was made that we were going to withdraw should the games be held. And for a couple of days, I, I think it was only about 24 hours we had to wait, luckily, but it was a really intense 24 hours because there was the possibility that the games went forward and Canada would be there. And that's pretty heart wrenching. Um, and for me, like Tokyo would likely be my last game. So what does that mean for my career? Um, when 
the announcement was made about the postponement, my initial feeling was relief um, because I think in the back of my mind, obviously we wanted to be joining, well, alongside or standing alongside the rest of Canada and doing what we could do to help mitigate the curve, uh, like mitigate the spread of the virus rather than focusing on peak performance. Um, but then when you actually take a step back and think about a 16 month trajectory and like in this period of time, like your normalcy is taken away and your community in a way is taken away. It does take a lot of strategy to try and like keep structure in your day and keep some focus and keep motivation. I think a lot of athletes experienced a huge plummet in motivation. And this time it must just be bizarre in your life. I mean, it's bizarre in everybody's life. Doesn't matter, you know, what your job is, whether it's Dr. Jeffrey Habert. I think we may have just caught a glimpse of him. Just a little tease. People are going, oh, I want to hear from that guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ryan Gallagher, who's uh, a firefighter. I mean, all of our lives have been turned upside down, but especially when you were trying to qualify for the Olympics and uh, all of a sudden that's postponed by a year and now you can't go out of your house and do the things that you normally do. Uh, I'm sure it's really tough, but I really, uh, I love talking to you. This was, uh, this is a very cool experience for me. Uh, I know that in my house, I'm looking at my wife and my daughter and uh, they're big fans of yours too. So thanks for talking to us. And I need one more question. Uh, mm. What is your go-to quarantine look when it comes to wardrobe? <laughs> can tell you I've it doesn't change much I live in spandex pants and uh, sports clothes so pretty much kept my wardrobe the same <laughs> right I, I so I I think that um because you're a professional athlete and that is actually your job is to be uh a, a, is it a trampolinist <laughs> is, is that is that yeah. did I say that right trampolinist um, we got a question on Facebook for you that said, uh, how are you staying in shape you don't have to go through everything but what are you doing at home to stay in yeah. shape I'm trying to find a bit of an opportunity in this situation too. And so I'm trying to like, usually my training is so regimented and so structured and now we have, do have the time um, and also lack of access. So uh, I'm trying a lot of new things, um, whether that's like, there's a lot of online classes that are free um, for different like yoga or Pilates or right. a hit workouts. So that's, I don't know. I'm just test testing things out and trying to have fun with it and, explore what my body's capable of from the confines of my uh, living room. Yeah. yeah. What, what, one sec, Case, what, uh, what was the exercise? It was a Nike thing you were doing, right? Nike training club. Nike training club. Uh, Casey was, uh, was doing that and she said it was, it was awesome and it's free. So um, that's mm -hmm. a pretty good combination. Thanks so much. Uh, and uh, I mean, I'm hoping that this pandemic will end uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, but if it is later, which most have anticipate, let's, let's continue this conversation. Okay. And thank you for speaking about mental health and being the Clara Hughes of 2020. Thank you so much. Okay. And tell your uh, husband to feel better, uh, you know, with his, uh, yeah. with his Achilles <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks so much. Uh, all right, Dr. Jeffrey Habert, how you doing? Hey, thank you for having me. I'm great. Uh, well, sort that was pretty cool uh, conversation oh, sort of. with yeah. uh, with Rosie. She's pretty awesome. Amazing. So you are Dr. Jeffrey Habert. And just so you know, I'm not telling you this. I'm, I'm pretty sure you're aware of this. Uh, assistant professor at University of Toronto Department of Family and Community Medicine. You're also a coroner, investigating coroner in the city of Toronto. And uh, you have taught other primary care physicians uh, how to do what it is you do, which is, um, you know, have, uh, have as much knowledge as you can, right, about mental illness and depression in particular. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. I spent a lot of time teaching primary care how to treat depression and mental health. Okay, so let's uh, let's play a little bit of a game. Not something people generally say on this topic, but um, as as you know from what I do, sick not weak. I mean, it's all about it's all about showing people you're wrong. All those things that you thought are wrong. So I'll throw some things out. You could say true or false, or I agree or disagree. Um, Let's go. Uh, depression and other mental illnesses are not the same as physical illnesses like cancer or diabetes. That's one of my favorite. False. Uh, people can deal with depression actually by sucking it up. That's another one of my favorites. False. Appreciating the blessings in life will make depression go away. False. Depression is a weakness, not a sickness. Very false. 
drinking is actually a very good wheel, way to deal with mental illnesses. False. Prescription drugs are always fine and harmless because doctors prescribe them. Not totally true, so I'd say false. Yeah, I mean, that, that is the perception, and uh, thanks for playing along. Um, we've, got, uh, we've got prizes for you afterwards for playing. Let's talk about depression and expose the myths. Uh, you know, one of the things that people believe, right, is that when you get a prescription, when you go to your shopper's drug mart or wherever and you pick up your pills, that you don't have to worry about them because, because you didn't buy them on the street. And the, the truth is that there are drugs like benzodiazepines, for instance, that, um, you know, you, you have to be aware of the risks. And while they may make you feel better in the short term, sometimes they can become a problem. Yeah, I mean, benzodiazepines are a great example. And, and, and I use the example that they're actually Band-Aids. And when I prescribe them, I say, you know what, we're going to treat your anxiety properly with a long term fix like the stitches. And the benzos are a Band-Aid. So you can put a Band-Aid on the cut. It doesn't fix the cut. The cut's still there. The cut needs to be stitched up. So that's my analogy for benzos. Now, you, uh, as a family doctor, uh, what percentage of your practice um, do you think people show up and um, they have a mental health problem? Now, they may not know they have a mental health problem, right? Because we know physical symptoms can arise out of them. But what percentage of practice would be depression and anxiety? 20 to 25%. Really? Wow, that much. Uh, and you have been doing this for a long, long time, obviously, long with 20 to 25. I've been doing this for, yeah, 30 years. So for 30 years, you have been seeing, you know, 25% of your practice come in with mental health challenges. Um, do we do better with it today than we did um, 30 years ago? And if so, how, how are we doing better? Because, uh, you know, it, it seems to me the level of struggle and, and certainly when it comes to suicide, um, the number of suicides in Canada has not changed uh, over the last 10 years, for sure. I mean, you brought up a very good point. The suicide, the numbers of suicides in Canada still are at about 4,000, and it's been about 4,000 for many years, but we've gotten better in certain ways. It's, there still is a huge mental health stigma, but it's gotten better. So the stigma that I used to hear 10 years ago is not as bad today. It's still out there, and I still hear the things that you gave as examples at the beginning, but it's certainly a lot less than I used to hear, number one. Number two, our medications not necessarily have gotten more efficacious or better, but they're easier to tolerate. So the newer medications are more tolerable. They have less side effects. They're easier for people to take. And, and our knowledge of depression has gotten better. We have PET scans. We have functional MRIs. We have more data that's out there. I know you've spoken to Roger McIntyre and Pratap Choka. These are guys that are icons in, in depression in Canada. And they do the research and, and, and so much research has been done. So, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do on, on this show, uh, Isolation Nation, for a nation of people that are feeling isolated and, and maybe experiencing not, not mental illness so much as they are, uh, you know, circumstantial illness. I'm, I'm wondering uh, what advice you have for people who, for the first time, maybe are going, I, I can't, I can't, I'm not sleeping well. Um, I find that I'm obsessed with, um, with, you know, COVID-19. You know, I dread the phone ringing because I'm afraid that it's going to be a family member telling me that they're in the ICU. All of those things. What, what advice can you offer? I mean, I, I tell people, especially those that are experiencing those kind of symptoms for the first time, that they're not alone. There's a country of 38 million people that feel the same way. And it, it's so important in this time of isolation. You talked about your father. I have the same with an, with an elderly mother that's living alone. It's important that people reach out to them. We have the technologies available now, whether it's video, audio. And it's so important, although you may be isolated live, you don't have to be isolated. And we have friends and family around and we should try and reach out as much as we can. Right, which is which is just sound advice. Uh, but I guess what I'm looking for is, uh, let, let's say I came into your office, you closed the door, and I went in a really aggressive way. Doc, you got to help me! Oh my God, I'm just like I'm on edge all the time because of this. You got to you you got to tell me something that I can do. Uh, 
and uh, I'm not leaving your office till you tell me. So no, no, fair enough. Right? And, 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 we, and we get these situations. I mean, they're they're virtual now. People aren't coping well with with COVID-19, whether it's a, an exacerbation of a pre-existing anxiety or whether it's a nuance in anxiety. I mean, you have to. So we talk about the facts of COVID-19. And if the anxiety is really getting to them, I'll try and suggest that they can do some self like some self-taught CBT there are websites for CBT that I'll often suggest. Uh, for the ones that are really not coping, they're decompensating. Those would be the ones that I would give a, a 10 to 15 day course of a benzo just to help settle them while they may learn to do some CBT at home. Um, what about uh, mindfulness? What about, um, you know, all, all of the things that are um, uh, different forms of relaxation, ways to Absolutely. sort of I mean, take I, your I, focus I think, off it. I mean, we can look at that. Exercise is still one of the most successful treatments out there for mental health. The depression guidelines, the anxiety guidelines, both include 150 minutes of exercise a week. We can still do that at this time. We can get out there for a walk. We should be socially isolated, but we can get out there for a walk. Mindfulness, you, you mentioned, is a great idea. Yoga is a great idea. And CBT, I mean, I go back to CBT because CBT is evidence-based cognitive behavioral therapy. You can teach it to yourself. There's websites out there like eCouch is a very famous website for anxiety-based CBT. It's based in Australia. It's a very, very commonly used website. And you can teach yourself CBT. Uh, here's uh, here's another question from a viewer on, on Facebook wants to know, is there a percentage that um, tells us whether people successfully are able to get off antidepressants. So I guess the question would be what percentage of people who want to get off anti antidepressants can do it? Okay, so let's, that, that's a great question. So if it's your first depression, we typically would treat you for a year. You would get off the antidepressant after a year, and the chance of you having a recurrence is about 50%. For the second depression, I would treat you for two years, uh, we would try and take you off the medication. But at this point, the chance of a recurrence is 70%. For a third episode, the current thinking is you should not get off the medication. But it's interesting that someone asked that because the diabetic or the hypertensive doesn't ask me that question. So, And that's a very common question. It's a great question, actually, because my hypertensives or my diabetics don't ask me how long they're going to have to be on their medications because they realize this is a physiologic illness like diabetes or hypertension. And, and in most cases, these depression, these drugs are going to be needed long term. But I appreciate you know, the question, especially yeah. for the first episode. You know, for me, um, would you call a person, I'm talking about me, and obviously it's somewhat tongue in cheek, a person who goes off antidepressants four times and relapses every time, would you call that person an idiot? No, I would never call you an idiot. I would say that you're being educated every time you go off the medications. You know, I'm a, I, I was like the last time I was off and I, I just fell so far into the hole. And I'm going to say this, my family's going to be able to repeat it with me. But November 24, 2008, Montreal Marriott Hotel, room 521, 4 a.m. in the morning. We're shooting off the record at the Grey Cup. And at four o'clock in the morning, I'm sitting on the edge of the bed and I'm going, wow, you know, I've been off medication for a year and a half. And I understand why people take their own lives. It wasn't that I was suicidal. It's that I understood the idea that the pain could be so great that you would say, you know, anything is better than this. So, you know, I think I am an idiot, but, you know, well what are you described. Do? No, but you describe that very well, the pain, because it is painful. And people describe that. I mean, we see that often in suicides. People describe it that I can no longer take the pain. You know, you know what's really weird, uh, Doc? I feel comfortable calling you Doc. Um, sure. You know, Doc, here's, here's the thing that's so weird. No one ever denies themselves treatment for physical pain, right? Yeah. No one would go, ah, I, uh, it is killing me. I, I'm not going to a dentist. I've been like this for a year. No, you know, you, you get this pain in your mouth and you go, oh my God, I got to go to the dentist and I got to get this pain to stop. Yet people will live their whole lives with this kind of awful mental illness pain that they deny themselves relief from it. Right. And it makes no sense. And really, you, you, this is equivalent to diabetes of the mind or hypertension of the mind or 
or cancer of the mind. If you had cancer, you wouldn't deny yourself treatment. Did you, uh, did I sell the toothache thing pretty well? I, I'm thinking I like that, that I did. I you like know why that. I was able to do it? My dad was a dentist. Okay. Yeah. So I, you know, so I, I come by, I, honestly, um, I want to, uh, I want to wrap this up and ask you, Case, can you just hold that up for me? We have another question and it is, what are the statistics of successfully? No, sorry. I already read that one. Way to go, Case. Um, Okay, there we go. Um, if you have a question, by the way, on Facebook, just uh, fire away. And it's okay, Case. Um, you don't have that one anymore? You could just say it out loud. If you've been on a medication for a long time. If you've been on a medication for a long time, does it become less effective? You know, it depends sometimes. Some of the problem we have is that people are on a suboptimal dose of a medication. So they're taking a medication for a long time. They feel better but they're actually not on the proper dose of the medication and the, and the depression can recur. Typically, if you're on an optimal dose and you're in remission and remission typically needs to be measured objectively, in most cases, we can maintain that remission. You know what, this was awesome. Uh, you know, you, uh, you, you parceled things up really nicely. Uh, and uh, I asked you like in advance, I said, you know, keep your answers shorter so we can get to more stuff. It was gold. I mean, you, uh, you nailed it, Doc. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Okay, so uh, we'll make the same deal that I made with, uh, with Rosie is that uh, this is probably going to go on for a while. So uh, let's find a, a chance to chat again. And uh, really good job. And thanks for your time. We'd love to come back. Thank you. That is, uh, that's the doc uh, who, uh, it's funny how he sees all those patients, not really funny, but the things that he hears are things that we all say. How, how it's, it's weird how we have this belief that we're the only ones, that I'm the only one that experiences this sense of low self-esteem, this sense of inability to experience joy, this sense of loneliness, this sense of hopelessness. And then you find out that everyone seems to feel the same way. It's kind of crazy. And it's certainly reassuring to find that out. All right. I always want to know what it's like to be on the front lines. Uh, Ryan Gallagher is a firefighter. He is also a mental health advocate. I did his, uh, his podcast, I guess, a couple of months ago. And that's when we became acquainted. Um, Ryan, how are you? Good. How about you? You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm great. You've obviously been very patient listening to the conversation. Uh, I was watching you to see if you rolled your eyes at all, if you, you know, if you made any uh, inappropriate signs and you didn't. So um, thank you for that. No, I was um, good. I, I thought it was maybe a setup. I'm last. You go Olympic medalist, doctor, me. <laughs> uh, and unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today, Ryan. Thanks for joining us and drive carefully. Um, Okay, so you are a firefighter. You are continuing, obviously, to do your job because you are the most essential of all the services. So now, what, what's, what's it like for you going out? You have a pre-existing mental health challenge. You talk about that all the time. Uh, now you're going out in a very high-stress job and add to that the fact that you don't know whether the environment you're going into is going to have this dreaded virus. And I think that's a, a, like perfect what you're saying. The, it's the unknown of this that is adding to the stress. So, you know, being a first responder, and yes, we're central, we're on the front lines right there with the police and, and cops, nurses, doctors, everybody doing a fantastic job. But it's the unknown. That's the scary part. Um, and people, you know, you can go with, well, you signed up for this. But at the end of the day, we're human. Um, and it's okay to be scared about these things. But the, the positive that we're kind of looking at from a department standpoint is management and the association on the union side are doing an absolutely fantastic job getting us information every day, pushing out new protocols uh, as to what we're supposed to be wearing to medicals. If we come across someone with COVID-19, whatever, um, and just interaction, daily interaction with crews now is being you know minimized. We're trying to do social distancing within the station. So uh, it's less less scary because we ha we're putting all the right things in place, but it's the unknown. Right. And, and you're going into environments. I mean, this has been going on now for, um, let's say, uh, a month. I mean, I kind of date it back to um, when Rudy Gobert tested positive for the Utah Jazz and they canceled the game against Oklahoma City. And then the NBA packed it in and then the NHL packed it in. And then it was like everyone, it seemed, was going, OK, you know, we got to lock people up. 
Uh, so it's been about a month. What what's what kind of experiences have you had um, going on calls where you're confronted with someone who you're going, OK, I don't know if that person has the virus or not. Uh, and again, that's the scary part is a lot of these people, too. Uh, and again, the, probably the doctor can speak a, a little bit better about this, but they don't have they're not presenting the symptoms like there's crazy statistics out there right now that people have it, but they don't have the symptoms presenting yet. Um, so that's what's, what's extremely scary. But we're, like I said, we're implementing a lot of extra measures. We're already extremely safe when we go to medicals with our, you know, our proper PPE, our gloves, our masks, our goggles. So we're just being extra cautious when we leave those homes. We have kind of a protocol in place where we dispose everything into a bag outside. We wipe the truck down as soon as we get back. We wipe down our gear as soon as we get back. Um, so again, we've put in a lot of amazing steps that it really makes us feel a lot safer and, and the medics are following suit and the cops. So we're really finding like, it's a, again, it's always been a team game, but more so now, uh, especially. You know, I, uh, you know, I, I respect the fact that you're doing what you're doing because uh, I'm now preparing to go out and walk my dog. So if I'm paranoid with this, hey, Phil, do we have a shot of me right now? Because I'm, I'm, I'm wearing this for a purpose. Uh, so, yeah, I'm all set to go out and walk my dog. That's how paranoid I am to, uh, to get dressed up and do all of this. By the way, a question from Facebook is um, what has your daily routine, routine changed like in the fire station? So we're implementing now, like uh, when, when we relieve guys, so we're on 24 hour shifts. Uh, when we relieve guys in the morning, they are to wipe down the entire station. Um, we are now calling from inside the bay. Hey, we're in the bay. We're ready to relieve you. They're coming out, taking their stuff off the truck, going back through another door. We then put our stuff on the truck. They exit a separate door. We enter. So we now have one main entrance, one main exit, and that the contact is from across the bay um, and everything is wiped down. And then we go, uh, we can go even further as the incoming crew and wipe everything down again, of course, wearing our gloves and everything like that. Um, and then again, after calls, uh, we already do a few of these steps, wiping down the trucks, changing certain like medical gear out, but just taking the extra steps to wipe everything down and, and then wash our hands um, is really what we're doing. And it's, it's going, it, like I said, it's, it's scary, but we're, I think we've got a, a better grasp of it, obviously as it develops. So. Yeah. I think, I think most of us do like, even, you know, even those of us that are not first responders, um, have a better idea how to, how to live in our homes, how to, how to walk the dog, how to go and get fruit and vegetables. I think we, you know, we all have learned, um, hopefully not by trial and error, but by, you know, by success without having to pay the price by making mistakes early on. Uh, I, I think that really what I want to know is what it's what, what it would be like if I don't know if you've been through it yet but a situation where you go into a house that maybe there is a fire and maybe you have to pick up somebody you know who who can't get out on their own um, knowing that you know you're touching them they're they're breathing on you I mean they're right there in your space is that something you fear and uh, I just want to hear how you react to that yeah. Uh, again, the fear is there, but uh, you know, we get past that because again, we did sign up for it, but again, we are human uh, and we kind of put that fear aside to do the job we're tasked to do. Um, and it actually happened a few weeks ago to a crew on my platoon where they did save somebody in, in a, in an apartment fire. Um, but with, in terms of this COVID-19, when we go into fires, we are in full bunker gear. And what I mean by that, it's, it's pants, right. jackets, that kind of helmet, a mask, gloves. So we're fully, fully done up. And then uh, when they brought that person out, they go straight to EMS. EMS has their protocol of what they need to implement uh, on a daily basis, regardless of this, uh, of this pandemic. Uh, and then we have protocols in place to decon our stuff where it all comes right. off. It's bagged, it's washed another set of gear comes into play that truck's taken out of service. So the guys can shower, do what they need to do and make sure every, everybody is uh, good to go. So, yeah, I mean, that's uh, yeah. I mean, I, I guess to some extent you guys are always prepared because of what you have to wear. Uh, I'm just going to ask my wife a question now. Hey, Karen, is my hair okay? Or do I have helmet head? You know, I, is it a problem? It's a 
Okay, thank you. You could have you could have eased me into it. No, she's going. Oh yeah, you do. Um, you know, you one great. of nah, that, that <laughs> sounded token, buddy. Um, so you are a person with a pre-existing mental health challenge. I guess what I want to know is, uh, are you worse now through this pandemic? Are you worse now that the world is kind of coming unglued? Um, it has moments. And when you talk about like the mental health stuff, and I love that you're doing this, and obviously you share your story. And I just want to quickly touch on that because uh, I had that similar thing. And we talked about it on my mental health uh, podcast, Mental Edge Lifestyle, where 2012, I sat there by myself at my house and I understood the exact same thing that you understood. Uh, and I was not, I was not going to take my own life, but I realized like, wow, I'm in a lot of pain. And I just basically stopped. My marriage kind of went for a dive, the drinking escalated. And this is why I want to share this because my story is similar to tons of people's stories. I just happened to share it because the importance of it and getting out there and sending your message is so, so important for people because they can learn from these lived experiences. I, I fell out of love with myself, if that makes any sense. Um, so now, though, with the mental health stuff, I've learned so many positive coping skills over the years. I didn't turn to medication, and, I, and I'm not saying anything bad about meds because I know the doctor's on here, and, and, and he's talked about the, the pros and the cons. And I'm on meds. And too. you're on meds, and you're doing you know, If you want to... It, yeah, if you want to scrap about it, I'll take you on, yeah. right? I'll take no you way. on. Yeah, no, on. no bring it on, support buddy. I'm, I'm kidding. I support but, whatever yeah. you have to do to get better. So in this yeah. time, uh, I'm just doing everything I possibly can to remain positive because I know that this is temporary and that's what we need to focus on. It's temporary. So, you know, really focus on practicing self-care. Uh, hold yourself and others accountable. Check in, call people. You know, get out, the, get out on, the, on Facebook, Zoom and, and make interactions with people so you can better your mental health. So in a way, uh, to answer your question, yes and no, it's dipped, but we're doing the best we can like anybody else. Um, here's a, a question on, on Facebook that we just received. And it's, uh, this is a good question. What is the scariest encounter that you have had since uh, this all began? Um scariest one it well medicals like any of the medicals because our dispatchers do a fantastic job of screening all those questions they need to ask but you know when it comes back oh yeah it's a negative test and then you walk in and it turns out oh you know what i actually you know we've had oh i actually just remembered i traveled right so stuff oh. you're like hold on a second you were asked these questions on the phone so that stuff there is is pretty scary. And again, now though, we're learning more and more as we go. So we're really we're implementing just different steps every day. It's changing that we can avoid okay. those scary situations. Yeah. Uh, thanks for all that honesty and, uh, and candor and giving us a glimpse inside, um, you know, the head and the experience and the fire station of someone that most of us really, really admire. Uh, I got one question. This may be a little too serious for you, but, you know, feel free to pass on it. But do firemen really love baked beans? It seems like every TV show, you know, there's someone on the pot with the thing and he's stirring the beans. Is, is, that, is that true? Uh, probably some of them. I, we're, yeah, our, our hall's pretty healthy. We had some people deliver some baked beans from a distance, of course. There you it's go. Funny, yeah. Why don't you bring that up uh, the other day? Um, and, uh, what are you watching? I, I need tips on TV shows. Do you have one? Oh, right now I got, uh, my wife and I got working moms. Good Canadian show. Working moms. Yeah. Yeah. Great. My show friend uh, actually is uh executive producer of that show. It's a great show. Oh, really? That's funny. Yeah. Um, yeah, modern family can't go wrong. I mean, it just ended. They but. just can't, they, yeah, they just, uh, it just ended for sure. Um, what's your, uh, what's your go-to uh, quarantine look? I asked Rosie that question. Uh, so like when you're around the house, which you are most of the time, if you're not working, what are you wearing? <laughs> uh, shorts and a hoodie is a go-to. Uh, I think uh, this is this is a time for uh, I mean, there's always something good and something bad. So this uh, this pandemic uh, has given a lot of us a lot more freedom, as I, I boasted at the top of the show, 22 days without wearing pants that had a button on them. That streak is a personal best. And as I alluded to yesterday, uh, if by any chance I croak from COVID-19, I've given instructions to my family not to bury me in pants with a button because it would be a shame to end the streak at that point. Uh, <laughs> Ryan, thanks, man. Uh, you stay healthy, you stay safe, and you know that um, that people 
really appreciate you, the firefighter, all the time. But especially at this time when, as you said, this is what you sign up for, but that doesn't mean that it's easy and that doesn't mean that it's not scary. And uh, we just appreciate you uh, taking risks so we can all stay healthy and alive. Well, thank you for your uh, kind words and for the time to kind of briefly share my story and, and, uh, and for everything you're doing. All right. Well, uh, on that note, um, we will say uh, come back again soon, even if it's just a token remark by me, because I already asked the doc and Rosie to come back. So I kind of feel like, you know, I, I wouldn't be very nice if you I got to come back on my podcast, then and I'll come back on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're, you're bargaining now. How about this deal? I don't come on your podcast and you don't come back. How about that? Oh, my God. I'm a terrible person. I try. Uh, you're awesome, man. Uh, big fan. And uh, thanks for doing this. Thank you. Uh, okay, that's uh, that's Ryan Gallagher and uh, a firefighter who's uh, who's doing a lot of the stuff that none of us would do. And yeah, it's always a scary job for sure. But at this point, when you never know the environment you're going into, that added fear um, could be really uh, really massive. We thank the doctor as well. Uh, I thought the doc was great, and I noticed something about his name, Doctor Jeffrey Haber. He's still listening right now. He's got MD, CCFP, FC. FP after his name. So I'm a big believer that you can actually speak in acronyms. And on the show, when I was talking about my mom, uh, I guess a couple of days ago, I wrote this and I decided to write another paragraph. So this is what I wrote. Born with GAD, some ADD, touch of OCD. Parents had a PhD in TLC, OMG, mom's RIP. So I wrote this. I'm a POW while my SRI is MIA, sending an SOS, going to CBS for my RX. So I'm going to build this out and I'm going to learn how in my life to only speak using acronyms. Um, speaking of people that have a quirky view on the world, there is Sean Cullen. He is, uh, well, I, I guess I could say he's our resident comedian because he's been giving us gold every single day. And one of the things that he's been learning and teaching us is the etiquette of COVID-19. Let's roll it, Phil. The COVID-19 Online Comedy Festival. And uh, I'm trying to help you out with isolation etiquette. And now shaking hands is an old tradition, a creepy tradition, but an old one. <laughs> and I think to discourage people from shaking your hand, we should have a new form of greeting. And that is as follows. Hello, you see someone approaching. They're six feet away. You put up your hand, stop. Then you stick your fingers in your nose lick your hand, and then grab your crotch. No one will want to shake your hand. It's the simplest and easiest and most effective way to discourage people from touching you. If you want to go a little farther, have no pants on or underpants, and then the crotch grab becomes even more unsavory. I hope this helps. Stay safe. Stay isolated. Wash your hands and wipe your bums. Thank you. <laughs> words, uh, words to live by, uh, Sean Cullen. You should, uh, you should check him out on, on Twitter at uh, Mr. Sean Cullen. Is that what, what it is? I think it is. And uh, COVID-19 Online Comedy Fest is the hashtag. Thanks to Jansen for saying to us ooh, a couple months ago, hey, you know what, guys? We like Sick Nut Week. Uh, do something good. And we hope we're doing something good. Spread the word. We're putting all this work into it. We want it to be seen. And uh, I try to leave you with a closing thought. Wait a second. Didn't Jerry Springer have one of these? Oh, my God. I'm the Jerry Springer of mental illness. Case, did he have a, he had a closing thought, right? No, oh, you're just saying you don't know because you don't want people to know that we watch Jerry Springer together. Uh, here's my closing thought for today. Do not abandon a person with mental illness when they act like a person with mental illness. Do not abandon a person with mental illness when they act like a person of mental illness. I thought if I said it a second time, it would sound even smarter. Uh, so that's our show for today. Uh, coming up tomorrow, we got, we got more medalists coming our way. Steph LeBay, goalkeeper for uh, the Canadian soccer team. Uh, they won a bronze medal, uh, plus Tessa Bonome, who won a, oh my God, this is like a cavalcade of medalists. She won a gold medal in 2010 playing for the Canadian hockey team. Um, that's uh, tomorrow on the show that we call Isolation Nation. Uh, thanks for joining us today. And remember to spread the word. What's the word? Isolation Nation. Sorry for talking to you like you're stupid. All right, we're done.
That's very good.